We coordinated. I know, right? Yeah, we I'm going to start the warning. I was, I was like, I'm going to wear red, and then I was like, man. Shut up. Going to start the warning MPA meeting tonight. Uh, could we have people introduce themselves so we know who is here? We'll start with uh, Dina and then go down this direction. All right. Tell me if this is not too loud, too low. My name is Dina John. And yeah, I'm happy to be here. And I'm the candidate running for city council. Uh, oh, which way are you going? I was going to go with Jake next and then nice go down this way. Uh, I am Jake Schumann. I am also the candidate running for city council. Um, uh, I am the independent candidate. I'll pass it off to Danny. Oh, we're doing, we're doing a go around. Uh, my name is Daniel Mutanu, and I live in Ward 3. Oh, okay. And yeah, are you working with one of the candidates here? No, no. I'm participating in a neighborhood assembly. Okay, okay. Uh, my name is Barry. I live in Ward 5. I'm hoping to get onto the public comment section of the NBA. Okay. That's also happening tonight. Okay. Uh, I'm a volunteer with uh, Proposition Zero and Community Control of the Police. Okay. I am Brian Tina. I live in Ward 2 currently. Although a lot of the new maps show me being foot and warty, and I'm also interested in, in civic engagement, so I probably would have come to the debate or watched it anyway, but I might someday be in Ward 8 with some of you, so, so hi. <laughs> well, I'm John Chapel Sokol. Um, I live in Ward 1 in the East. My name is Chapel Sokol. I live in Ward 1, and I'm not a candidate. <laughs> I'm Andrea. I live in Ward 8 in Houston first. I'm Keith Pillsbury. I live on University Terrace in Ward 8. You're on the steering committee. <laughs> I'm Lauren Ebersol. I live in Ward 8, and I am also a member of the steering committee. Uh, I'm Bill Church. I'm also a member of the steering committee. I live in Ward 8. Okay. Our first item on our agenda is after the introductions is to to allow uh, people to have a chance to speak out on issues other than the candidates uh, tonight. Does anybody want to speak, have a, something they'd like to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Barry. Um, I am here as a volunteer for two voters initiated charter change uh, proposals and petitions that are uh, going to be on the March ballot. Uh, we're pretty sure we've met uh, the minimum threshold uh, of the required signatures. If you haven't, uh, please consider signing them. Uh, the first one is Proposition Zero, which is um, basically will give Burlington voters the ability to propose and pass ordinances through majority rule. Uh, this will give us uh, the ability to put out our, our proposals uh, and have a citywide vote. Uh, we, this will also bring Burlington on par with the rest of Vermont, where all the other municipalities already have this in their charter. So we are hoping to uh, get that uh, in the March ballot and uh, also to hope, hopefully we will have everybody voting yes. Uh, and the second one is the uh, police accountability petition, which will give, uh, uh, which will create a civilian oversight board uh, to handle police complaint and in investigation. Uh, that petition also, I think, is at, uh, just met its, uh, its uh, required threshold, but we want as many signatures as we can find. I think it's really important to uh, rebuild the public trust in our law enforcement. Um, so if you want to learn more, uh, it's propositionzero.org and people for, for policeaccountability.com. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments for the public? Okay, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Lauren. She's going. <clears throat> she is our moderator for the uh, forum with our candidate. Uh, one of our candidates, Maya Brand, has just sent me an apology saying she's not able to attend tonight. Okay. All right. Um, so before we get started and open the floor to our candidates, I just wanted to spend a few minutes going over ranked choice voting because this will be the first election that Burlingtonians can use ranked choice voting since 
I think, what, 10 years? <laughs> um, so this was approved in March 2021. And basically what it is, is all uh, voters will have the choice to rank first through fourth with the write-in option. Um, all of the options on the ballot for our East District City Council member. Um, so four columns, four choices. You can vote for as few as you want. Um, you should always vote for your first choice. And then after that, you can choose if you'd like to have a second, third, or fourth. Um, the candidate must achieve, a candidate must achieve greater than 50% of the vote to be considered the winner. If not, it will go to an immediate runoff where the lowest vote, lowest voted candidate will be eliminated and then the voting process will begin again. Um, and that will continue until one candidate has greater than 50% of the vote. Um, so are there any questions on that before we get started? Because that is important to understand as we're listening to our lovely candidates talk tonight. So yes. When the lower uh, voted candidates are eliminated, if they're, they're set number two, that's added to? So if, if we say that one candidate, no one has reached greater than 50% of the vote, and out of the, there's three candidates yeah. in this, and I think, I don't think the run any write-ins would count for that. Um, I think it would just be who is on the ballot. Um, so then if we have to go to a runoff, it would just be the two candidates yeah. against each other. And whoever was the least voted, that third candidate would be the one that would be eliminated. So then instead of three options, it would be two options. Um, that's a good question. I'm not, so I, the, the second, the person second, the, the, the person who got the least number of votes, the people that <coughs> voted for that person, their second choice would be added to the other two candidates. All right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Have my notes on one wasn't in there. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. So then we can get started. Um, so we have a general outline tonight uh, where the candidates will have a chance to talk about the issue that they feel is the most pressing for the East District, which includes wards one and eight. Um, but before we get to that issue, um, they, you guys have the option to give a brief opening statement. So I will let ladies go first. <laughs> Thank you. We also had a thumb more that determined that. Okay, yes, I, I should overhear that. You can repeat that if you like. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name is Tina John, and I'm running um, underneath the Progressive Party. And I think, so I grew up here. I'm a long-term resident. And, um, you know, I've been a victim of housing insecurities, food insecurity, um, public safety. I also lost a friend this summer to gun violence, and that was a big newspaper read. And I think the reason why I am running um, it's because, so I work in the courthouse and I remember one day coming home and no longer being affected by the public safety. It's just stopped. I got so used to it. It being so much of like my cases every day for murder, um, like uh, mental health, drug cases. And I just, it's, I stopped feeling anything because it just became part of my life. And that I thought that was wrong. You know, I was like, that's not okay. And I thought, what can I do? And, and then it was that, but also seeing issues being talked about but not enough representation in the room. You know, oftentimes I'm the only black woman, I'm the only immigrant in the room. Luckily I'm not in this sense, which is really great, but that's also something I wanted to change. You know, when we talk about these issues, it's really important that everyone from different identities are there because they're also impacted by them. So I'm running for that. And I'm also running to be the, mo the person who's most involved in public safety to finally be on council. But thank you. Yeah. I think if we leave this between us, we can share it. Yeah. Um, so my name is Jake Schumann. I um, announced my candidacy um, early on as an independent, and I sought the progressive and democratic endorsements as a means of, um, you know, having an audience, but also to put forward my theory that our city has been harmed by partisanship that we see at the national and state levels. Um, having 
lost uh, the progressive endorsement to Dina, who I am very pleased, you know, earned that endorsement because I think that you're a great candidate mm -hmm. in this race. Um, I I did not seriously seek the Democratic endorsement. I went to the Democratic caucus and I said, you know, I'm going to say my piece, but I think that you all should vote for um, Maya so that we can have a true ranked choice contest. Um, so I, I decided to remain in the race as an independent um, so that we can try out what this ranked choice thing is all about, right? Our last race was in 2010. So I think a lot of people weren't here when that happened. Um, and a lot of people um, might have, um, you know, forgotten how it works in our city. So I think that um, it's important to have a lot of people involved and engaged in the process. And so that's why I'm here. I'm here to encourage other people um, to put their name out there, to stand up and raise their hand and say, I am interested in doing more for this community. Um, and that's why I'm really glad um, to have two worthy candidates in uh, Maya and in Dina um, also stepping forward. I think all of us are newcomers to um, this level of the political process, but we've all been engaged in our community uh, thus far. And I, I just think that in, in this city, we have a long and strong history of really powerful community-led and community-involved movements. Um, and so I am okay with being an independent. I think that's gonna fare very poorly for me in this election, but I'd like to see more independents stepping forward um, because I think that if we have real people running and we have real people representing us, then we're gonna have a really strong community. So you can call me an independent, you can call me Jake Schumann, but what I call myself is a human. <laughs> Thank you, Jake. All right. Um, so now um, we will give each of the candidates two minutes to, well, actually, we'll do this one at a time. So we'll do one candidate gives two minutes on what they feel is the most pressing issue in the East District. Um, and then other candidate has a chance to respond and then a rebuttal for that. And we'll do that for each of you. Um, so, Dina, if you'd like to lead off. Also, I didn't like Jake going off. I feel be fair. Like, oh, yeah, that was very, very good point. Okay, Jake, go ahead. <laughs> um, so this is the third time we've been asked this question. And uh, the first time and the second time I had different responses. So I kind of want to keep up that momentum and, and have a, another new response for what I think is the most pressing issue um, in the East District. Um, and it's not that much of a departure from what I said last time, which was about um, equity. And I'd say, I'd build on that, right? And I'd say inclusion. <clears throat> and I'd say that the most pressing um, issue in the East District is the, the way that people are not included in our democratic processes. So look, for example, at the conversation that we're having around redistricting, right? Um, there are a lot of conversations happening about what to do with the students in the dorms, um, what to do about wards one and wards eight, ward one and ward eight, um, how to make it so that no one ward has um, a larger share of the student population such that you have a smaller number of people influencing that election um, so that fewer people effectively have more representation than in other parts of the city. I think that um, in March, we are going to have the opportunity once again to vote on whether or not we allow um, non-citizen residents of our city to participate in our local political process. And I would love to use this platform and I will continue to do so, strongly encourage the local population to support that effort. I think it's very important. Um, and I think that it's, Sorry. it's. thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. It, it really boils down to, it's not just about allowing people to participate. It's, uh, it's about allowing people to be a part. Thank you. Great, you have one minute. Yeah. So yesterday, um, I'll tell a brief story. Um, I was out door knocking and then I went to this neighborhood and both of them experienced break-ins into their homes. 
one side said wanted more increased police patrolling their neighborhood because of their home break in. And the other person said they wanted more community um, policing and more community support. Both sides wanted different answers, but they both wanted one solution, which is their homes not to be breaking in. And both of them experience not enough safety. And I think for me, what I realized as I'm doing more campaign, more door knocking, as well as my job, is that it really comes down to the us versus them mentality. I really feel like that is like the biggest root cause. And that's what's adding to these issues because everyone wants the same solution, but at the same time, it's this one size fits all. You know, how do you trust po po uh, police, like pub public safety, policing? I want less police because another day I don't feel safe. I want more policing because I don't want to feel safe, but you both don't feel safe. You know, same thing with um, like, um, so I talked to someone who said their daughter's a social worker. And they said, I feel very scared that my daughter's being called to address public safety cases. Another person says, well, I want more social workers out there because I don't think they need to be responsible for every mental health crisis. They all want the same answer. I think the one reason why I'm running is because I have the three candidates. Like I'm the most directly involved in public safety cases. Like that is my job. And, and also with housing cases, like I'm a renter, Jake's a renter, me as a landlord. But I work with landlords and renters. You know, I deal with bad renters. I deal with bad landlords. So I think for me, it's more so like kind of changing this ideology of like, us versus them, only my solution can work. We're not going to solve the problem and we're going to increase being deadlocked, which is why people are sick of city council and politics is nothing's being done. Like I want a solution so we can all go home. And less cases for me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So you can each have a minute to rebut anything in what each other said as the most important issue. So if you'd like to address anything that Jake said directly, and Jake, if you'd like to address anything that Dina said, um, I'm not sure which I think if we go back yeah. to Jake, that might be the most fair. And then Dina, you can. Yeah, well, so I think one of the reasons why um, community is such an aspect for this election is because, first of all, me and Jake are in different parties but we did an event together for um, People's Kitchen. We brought diapers out to mothers in the neighborhood. And we spent that time knocking and like bringing the diapers and just really talking. We both realized that, yeah, we all care about the same thing. And I think that's like, there is a shift. We all feel this discomfort right now. Like a whole community, the, our whole world feels it. So it's more so of a, a lot of us just are kind of trying to get away from the partisanship, getting away from the deadlock and just kind of coming together. Like he may, may not get on everything, but like that is OK. Like that's not how things are going to go. So I'm not against Jake. Honestly, what I want that day of this election is that, um, I don't know, like more community and more engagement. That's why we're all here. That's why people from different wards here, like ward, you're from Ward 3. Five, you're forward two. You know, we all experience different experiences, wards, but yet we're all feeling the same shift of concern. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And thank you for the shout out. Yes, yeah, it's we might not agree on everything, but we can work together on most things. Um, I don't know that we found anything that we can't work together on yet. Um, and you plug my thing, People's Kitchen, so I'll plug your thing, <laughs> uh, Free Her Vermont um, at their launch party. I walked in two minutes later, Dina walked in and we're like, hey, and then, you know, everybody in the room is is connected to one of us. Um, and so like building that community, I think, is really meaningful. Um, and I think that's the mark of a pro-social, community-oriented, positive campaign is when you have three candidates and you have three communities coalescing behind these three candidates and we find the bridges and we build the connections between everyone. Um, I would just say that... Um, to what you were saying, I, I agree about how we have groups in the city who are kind of uh, antagonistic towards the police or feel like there's, you know, negative relationship there. We have people who feel that they have a positive relationship there. And then we have people who are ambivalent. Um, and I think that all of these people can find common ground and um, compromise through community oversight of police. If we can root out the, the bad apples that the police force has not rooted out on its own, we can all trust the group that remains that much more. Thank you both. Um, so now we will open it up for questions um, from our 
board members. Um, I will ask that you just note if you want to address it to both candidates, one candidate over the other, and candidates, if you could keep your responses to one to two minutes, that would be ideal. That way everyone has a chance. Let's make sure Linda. Yes, and I know Linda. Linda is online. Linda? She, she said she wanted. Do you have a bunch of questions? <laughs> I do uh, have some questions. Yes. Okay. Don't, yeah. don't have a do bunch I, of questions. Go ahead. You want me to start? Yes. And we'll try and do like round, maybe round robin. So yeah. Linda, you can ask one and then we'll see yeah. and then we'll come back to you. <laughs> uh, okay. So um, let me look at my list here. Um, city council takes a significant amount of time, both in terms of meetings and dealing with constituents and preparation. And I'm wondering, how does that fit in with your schedule? Did you start this one? I said this one? Okay, both yeah. This is a both question for both people. Yes. Yeah. So I think my favorite thing about my job is it's so community involved. So it's like I work from 8 to 4.30 dealing with like community and state um, wide issues. So then, I, and then I have the special privilege of like taking that all in. And then if I was to council, it's just to bring that into the council and say, Hey guys, like this has been what the day has been like in, in Burlington and Vermont. These are issues happening. Just kind of want to put that out there and just kind of form people. Cause every day the councils represents different ward. So that's one of the reasons why I think my schedule fits really well. Cause I go from one community work to another community work. So that's why I think I my schedule wouldn't be of, of harm. And I'm also really connected to different organizations um, that are really excited about my candidacy because they are even more interested in getting involved. Like we need increased representation city council. Can I just interrupt here? I'm very interested in the time yeah. commitment because a previous city councilor was not able to make the time commitment. Oh, well, I mean, like I said, I get to work at 4.30 Monday through Friday, so my schedule is free. Thank you. Um, so I appreciate um, your question. I also appreciate the clarifying question that you just made, because I think it's important for us um, not to judge others based on the actions or inactions of other people, right? Um, neither Dina nor myself are the same as, um, uh, Jack or Allie. yeah, right at Jack or Allie. I, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but while I am throwing people <laughs> under the bus, um, I, I guess I would note, like, you know, something that bears stating is that this is now the second of second candidate forum that Maya has not been present at. Um, so I think that is also telling and responding to your question. Um, because I think that a lot a lot of people ask that question based on the comment that Ali made in the seven days article where she she mentioned that maybe young people instead of instead of assuming why I'm asking yeah. the question, if you could just yeah. answer the question, do you have the time? Uh, uh, yeah, um, well, so I just I just wanted to clarify a few things before I got there, but I, I do appreciate that um, we do need to hold each other accountable, right? So I appreciate you holding me to account. Um, so yes, I do have the time. Um, I certainly do. And I did that gut check before signing up for this. And I have spoken to that at length at other forums. Um, but I would also just... Um, take this opportunity to mention another part of my platform is that we need to pay our city councilors. They shouldn't be volunteers who earn a stipend. If we can have a professional city council who are paid for at least 20 hours a week, then we can have a city council that is representative of our community. We can have working class people with kids who, who are on our council. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to clarify, clarify that um, the last three Ward 8 representatives have complained about the amount of work and have all either quit or decided not to run. So that's three. I would say there's a significant amount of work to be done. And how one does that is going to be key to the success. Yeah. And I don't think it's just go from one job to the next. I think you're going to need support. Um, you're going to need to talk to people in the wards, get their opinions and their input, take them help. And I think that 
that didn't happen. Um, but we're not here to review that, but it's a long history of eating up ward councilors in Ward A. That's where they go to it's a graveyard for city council. So. Well, I just want to add though, like the last four years, like I was a I was a D1 athlete on full scholarship, two double majors, two jobs, but I was also working on a law firm, doing volunteer work, addressing sexual assault cases. I was working with the Winooski Education about their bill they want to pass. I was thinking about all, and I graduated with honors. So I'm really, I don't play around when it comes to community at all. And I'm very, very committed. I think that's what I'm really excited about as a young person because I'm very energetic and I'm I'm not here to play around. If I was, then I would have not accepted the candidacy one week and had one week to campaign to win the progressive party. Mm -hmm. So I just want to get that out there. So yeah. Think this is be? Oh well I mean well I mean we have a lot of issues. Public safety and fulbright housing, those are really, really deep depressing issues and that's why I'm out every day 8 to 4 30 and then I'm door knocking I was just door knocking all night I only stopped because of this ward one meeting after this I have people that need me to call that like it's a full-on commitment and I I come from a working class family so like you know I'm, I'm representing them in their lives and that's really that's something I, I can't play with yeah likewise um you know at the during the pandemic I, I was also going to school full-time getting straight A's um and also working 40 hours a week at a homeless shelter um, where I was paid for 40 hours a week, but I was actually working 60 because, you know, this was the opportunity to get people who are experiencing chronic homelessness housed, right? Um, and on top of all that, I was volunteering with the People's Kitchen about 10 hours a week. So we both have very strong work ethics because when you are, um, you know, when, when you're at like, the bottom or near the bottom of the totem pole of our society, you got to work real, real freaking hard. Well, there's, I'm sorry. Yeah. And, and to answer your question, I'd say about uh, it, based on my conversations with other city councilors, I've been told that some weeks it's 40 hours, some weeks yeah. it's close to no hours, um, depending on what's going on, but to expect an average about 25 hours a week. So that's how I've done my arithmetic. Me as well. And I'm ready. I really want to help. Uh, anyone else in the room? Keith, did you have a question or anyone? I, I will ask. Is anybody else want to ask? Yeah. Do you think that we can work for one people at some point? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I understand after yeah, maybe all yeah, the Yeah. We're getting used to this, Jonathan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a fast yeah. experience. Anne, did you want to ask? Yeah. Um, so the city council, I believe, unanimously recently agreed to. Um, increase the cap on police officers from 74 to 87. And given your um, comments, I just wanted to ask if you agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I do agree with that, especially um, when you consider that uh, a third of our force right now is, is not able to be on the beat. Um, so I think when we consider how many folks who are on the force are you know are on leave or um, on administrative duty due to injuries or other commitments or maybe they're a detective and they don't usually go on the beat. Um, I, I think it's important to to recognize that they have needs to meet. And at the end of the day, like when we call for service, we, we want somebody to show up, right? Um, I called recently for what could have been a very serious emergency for somebody else in this town. Um, and it took 45 minutes for a response. So yes, I do. And okay, yeah, let's respond. Yeah, I mean, I second with all of what Jake's saying. And what I would say also is someone who works in the courthouse and that, um, yeah, these cases are increasing every day. Like every day I'm dealing with more and more cases. I'm dealing with the same issues of um, people feel the police is not immediately there and they are complaining about that. I'm also working with police officers who are in situations where they don't feel as comfortable or feel like that should not be their place. And, you know, I'm out of the day, like, you know, we can take, I know a lot of people have issues with progressive parties and how they handle policing, which is 100% valid. I'm not someone to ever go and get someone's concerns about public safety. But what I would say that even if we have 500 police cars for the 500 
500 police for the 500 police cars that were stolen. I mean, cars that were stolen. Like, it's still not going to help the problem. You know, we can take away all the progressives from the city council. It's not going to solve the public safety issue problem. As someone who works in the courthouse, like, I can validate that from a non-political lens. So what I'm supportive is what Jake is saying, is that let's get to that number that we need and then take a step after that by dealing with interconnected issues. We can have a police person stationed in every single car, every single bike, every single home. It's it's but not feasible. Because I've actually heard the opposite, that the police are not going to come here because they don't feel supported by city council. Yeah, I've heard that from police officers. Yeah, but I also see I've heard that, but I've also heard also and like and that's like the thing though, and that's what I was saying earlier. Everyone has their concerns and that it should be like really validated because what everyone's saying is true. You know, the people who don't feel safe, like when you don't feel safe, like that doesn't really get no one can really take that away from you unless you see a solution being effectively um enforced. And so I support, um, gave that number where it needs to be. I support community engagement and also building community trust, um, transparency and accountability. Like we can really, really get there. And I think that's the reason why I'm running because I work with both sides and I don't think it's us versus them. It's more of a public safety. Let's make everyone feel safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think like, so I don't want to give any specifics about like the time, place, circumstances, because it's possible that the reason I called the police or 911, I called 911. The reason I called 911, it could have been a medical emergency, but it could have also been a domestic violence situation. So that's why I'm being um, non-descriptive. But, you know, because it could have been a medical emergency, like it didn't need to be an officer who went to do a wellness check. It could have been the fire department that did that. Um, I think a point that bears repeating is that when people dial 911, we don't always need to send people with guns. As somebody who served in that role um, for a very specific geographic location um, for a year, yeah, I'm I'm not frightened of that. There are people who are not frightened of that, and I think it is safe. Professionals should be making that call. Yes. But that's the CSL and CSO program. They have a hierarchy and they have, exactly, exactly. And they have the backup and the support that they need when they need it. Yeah, and I also did sit down with Moreau actually in this room for like an hour. And like I, we really had a really long, deep conversation from different sides. And, you know, I expressed my concern, he expressed me his concerns. And, you know, where we both left off is that we may not see the same, but like there's a clear problem. And I really think the community concerns needs to be the number one priority as we make decisions about policing, police staff, answering the calls. Because if you're going to tell a parent who's whose daughter's a child social worker that they should be out there, like they're going to feel some type of way, like they have every reason to feel like that's your child out there. But there's some social workers that want to be out there. There's some police that want to be there, but others don't. So let's all just kind of find that middle ground. And that's with the mayor, that's with the community, that's with the police department, that's with social workers. I'd like to change the subject totally. I think our, I think the, the university district, boys eight and one, it has a bigger problem than policing. Mm -hmm. It's really housing. And what that means is young people who are trying to start a career, who don't make a good income as a starter, can't afford to stay in our city. And I think that is really, we, we've seen that lethar, lethargic attitude. It, it feels like the real estate people, the landlord, not, I don't wanna name everybody, but big corporate landlords and, the political establishment and the university seem to all be in cahoots about making our district, our streets, homes for basically people who come in, you know, the last class, at, the, the, the freshman class at eight is 84% out of staters. We're giving homes, giving, giving uh, living units to transitional people transitioning, coming into our state, playing in our city, and then leaving. And nobody seems to be doing anything about it. Although you all have on your 
placards, affordable housing. Well, how did we get out of this situation? And what are your, what would you think would be the way to solve it? Yeah. So when I first ran, housing was actually my main platform. Um, I think also because I had to do an honor study on housing, come up with policies. And so I graduated from UVM, but also in the seven days I did, as I said, I did call at UVM. The over minutes, I mean, it's of students every year, they're adding to the housing crisis. If you're, they're choosing a lot of out of state students. My theory is because out of state students bring more money than in state students. And I think my one of the reasons what I want to do is really hold that them accountable for that, even as someone who graduated, because I know what's like to not have a home. I know it's like to be housing insecure. It's a really scary position, but I also live in a family dominated neighborhood. And so I want to hold UVM accountable. I want to also work closer with Champlain Housing about how do we build more housing for people that can afford it. I want to also make sure housing sustainable. And also, like, like I said earlier, we need to hold UVM accountable. Like, I'm not scared to do that. Like, that's really the bigger, one of the biggest issues here. Keith, um, I think there's something in your question that I want to pick on specifically. I think that we could have a whole forum just about housing because we have a very long history in this city of all of the creative solutions that we've brought to bear on um, how to provide more housing for more people more equitably. But you spoke about large landlords, large property owners, and I think that's something um, to pick on, right? Like, I think of Cambrian Rice, uh, almost a thousand units of housing. Um, based on the numbers, it has the ability to increase our housing stock by 6%. One housing development could increase our entire amount of housing by 6%. Six sounds small, but that's a huge number of units to bring online. But the way that they're building it is very slowly and very incrementally. And why are they doing that? They're doing that because it won't flood the market with housing, it won't lower the cost of housing so that they get the maximum return on investment, right? So I think that if we're going to allow property developers to build large um, amounts of housing, we should work with them to bring it on more quickly. We need to feel a sense of urgency here because right now people are getting... Um, essentially evicted from this city because they can't afford to pay um, increased cost of housing as they move from one apartment to another or their landlord sells their unit and the new owner wants to charge higher rent or um, you know it's a you know a no cause eviction right so many things so many things to discuss here but that's just one Linda, do you want to, do you have any other questions? We'll do another loop around Ward 8 and then we can open it. Sure, I'll just do a follow-up on Keith's, which is, uh, I was very interested in this idea of holding UVM account, of holding UVM accountable. Um, I think we all know how, you know, what their, some of their policies have led to a lot of this housing problem. And I'm wondering how you think UVM can be held accountable and what kind of solutions do you think they can bring and why it would be different this time? Because these have been something that has been talked about for many, many years. That's our best for you. Yeah, well, I mean, well, I mean, I think one key is that we need to make sure the mayor is here present when we talk about the um, idea of holding UVM accountable. I really think when we have these conversations, we need to make sure we have people with more power than us in the room, more power than city council, which is like the mayor, like he needs to be here because on the day, like he has greater power in that decision. I think once we get to that step, then we can talk about um, sit down meetings, you know, like I think Champlain Housing is such a great housing trust. And I feel like including them in these conversations, we need to build a coalition. So when we do a trust to I'm like, they have to answer to us. So I feel like that's I'm kind of open more so in that route of starting that conversation with the people who have more power because I think city council only has so much power. Can I just also do a little follow up here, which is yeah. to 
add in what your thoughts are about the training. Wait, let's let Jake answer and then you can follow up, Linda. If that's okay. okay. Um, well, you know, you look at the Trinity campus conversation, right? Um, where the University of Vermont needs a variance to build the things that they want to build in the way that they want to build them. So there's an opportunity for leverage there. Um, and I think ultimately we have very little leverage with the University of Vermont as a municipality. Um, and so that to, to, to have a relationship with them that is more productive and meets everybody's needs really, I think, requires a stronger relationship between city council and our legislative delegation. Um, I think that, I mean, like, I have no reason to question the strength of that relationship right now, but I can, I can, I, I, I can just say that, you know, I, I, as a city councilor, would work with our, our state legislators to um, do what we need to do to 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 get UVM to do the things that they need to do for our community. And then your Thank you. Linda, your follow up. Yeah, did, did you want to follow up, Linda? No, that's okay. I'll give other people a chance. <laughs> All right. Any other board eight questions? Well, I have other and questions. I no one else. Right. Well, I, everyone in the room is silent, so we can let you get. Another couple and Linda. Okay, so here's a question for you. So quality I like of your life, question. <laughs> quality of life issues like um, noise issues, for example, um, have kind of taken a back burner since defunding happened. And I was wondering in the face of all the issues that you think, you know, that there are big issues, whether or not um, you think that quality of life issues are deserving of attention and um, what would you personally do to, to help uh, constituents with these issues? Yeah, so I think um, what I like, a quality of life issue that I think is important that took a back burner um, as the police prioritize different things um, is traffic safety. Right. Um, a lot of people are are driving in ways that are not very safe, um, and that's creating situations where people choose not to walk or bike. Um, and so that's a quality of life issue that individual decisions that are made for good reason then impact all of us, because then there are more cars on the road um, and the environment suffers. Um, but I also want to talk about the quality of life issue that we describe differently, right? Uh, safety, housing. These are quality of life issues that people don't have housing is a quality of life issue. That people have suboptimal housing is a quality of life issue that people don't feel safe. I agree with Dina, like we can't argue with people's feelings. So um, for whatever reason that people feel unsafe, like that is a quality of life issue. Um, so as far as, you know, how to deal with that, I mean, it's, it's everything. It's all of it. Um, yeah, I think my stance to quality of life, um, when I was door knocking earlier today, I was on East Ave and I was talking to someone and they were talking about crossing the street. Their road is so busy. The cars just go. And then as they're walking, like he says, like the cars literally just like slam. And there's like, oh, you're there. And I'm a long time runner. Every time I run there, it's very, very scary. You know, it's like little things like that, as well as elderly woman was telling me how she feels like elderly people are taken out of the conversation and that everyone thinks, oh, we're just old, like da da da. But she's like, but like my life matters too, like my rights. I was like, yeah, it does. So I really feel like it's these, the little things add to quality of life, like walking, making sure elderly people feel safe whenever they drive and cross the street, but cross the street, but mm -hmm. also what Jake's saying to public safety, food housing. And I'm also going to put out there education. So um, in this, this spring, I worked with the Winooski School District about them wanting to pass for increased funding. And my role was to deal with English language learners and like um, the low income students and how, you know, how their families need support with um 
getting jobs. And because if they can get a job, then their kids can't eat. If their kids can't eat, then it's like the kids aren't going to go to school. So, you know, that is also quality of life issue. Education, making sure students who attend school, who come from my background, which is like low income, new American, that they have the resources they need. Um, so they're able to participate because if they don't, most likely you're going to have them out in the streets. And the next thing you know, that's going to add to public safety. So I'm really breaking everything down from personal experience as well as work experience. And um, with the students aspect, um, I worked with student conduct at EVM as well as um, one of our representatives, Taylor's student conduct. So I'm really, if counsel, I really want to work with him in that area about students and like the noise control, because that's an issue and that's an issue in my day-to-day -day job. Thank you. More questions in the room, Ward Aiders? Okay, Linda. <laughs> I'll ask another question. Um, have you, are you familiar with the issue that um, where, where there's, um, there, I think there's an issue in ordinance committee about having homeless people have camping rights in uh, the public parks. I was wondering if you're familiar with that and what are your thoughts about it, if you are? Um, yeah, so I'm familiar with that due to like research and talking to um, whenever I door knock, but also like back to what I was saying earlier, I really want us, as we're addressing the issue of homelessness, I really think it's really critical that they're also involved in this conversation as well. You know, I feel like oftentimes they get treated as like, like less, lesser than other than like ostracized in society, but sort of like, if you, if you want to talk about woman issues, you have to have a woman a part of it. If you want to trust about homelessness issues, we have to make sure the homeless community is a part of it too, because they're of the day, they're the ones living on the street. We're going home. So I wanted that's I'm really big on whenever you trust these issues that everyone is involved because it's not fair for us to talk about issues if the person who's the biggest victim is not there. So that's something I want to do. And that's why I've been really working with volunteer groups about homelessness um, and also about mental health aspect of it too. So that's my answer to that. And I'm open to working with homeless people by addressing homelessness issues. No, but, but like that's that's my answer though. It's because you know we I may have my opinion on it, but I feel like we need to also make sure we're getting their voices and how they feel about that. My opinion on it. Well, end of the day, I'm in support of making sure that homeless people of the day have a sense of home and security, just how I am for people who have homes. So I want to find like the perfect answer to that and how I'm trying to is talking to different groups of people and door knocking and um, um, talking to my neighbors. Yeah, if I can glom on to that wonderful um, sentiment that you just expressed. Um, I'm not speaking to anybody in this room or on the Zoom, um, but I think it is a sentiment that I found out there speaking to members of the community that some people view homelessness that it exists as the problem, and some people view homeless people as the problem. And I think it's really important to recognize that it's the former and not the latter, um, that homeless people are worthy of dignity and that we should not describe them as a problem, but as victims. Um, so moving on to answer the question, um, I actually consider as my friends, um, two of my fellow uh, millennials who work for the city um, in the police department and in the parks department who coordinate closely on um, that policy that city council is now looking at. Um, my understanding is that it used to be a somewhat informal policy that the city had around um, encampments on public lands. Um, and now city council I don't know if they're looking at formalizing a policy or just amending a, a formal but informally um, enforced policy. Um, but historically, we have been very humane about it. And um, with the public sentiment that has begun to be expressed that describes homeless people as the problem, folks are being moved um, more often than they had been. Um, and in the past, 
folks were were guided to areas that were out of the way that they would not cause um you know neighbors to feel unsafe and if encampments were broken down property would be stored and retained for them so we used to be very humanistic about it Thank you. Thank you. Linda, you can. I don't think we have any from Morty in the room. And I know we'll, I'll save a few minutes at the end if we to make sure. Oh, go ahead, Keith. Um, I don't know. I it's from what I, I'm hearing you. You know, you don't sound like you live in the neighborhood that I live in. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, we have. We have a good quality of life from eight o'clock in the morning until maybe eight o'clock at night. But between 8 p.m. and the next morning, it's not. And we live on a street that's getting more and more kids, more and more families. And we'd like it to be that way. And um, so I still don't understand how you don't think we can't take on UVM and say to you, you need to hot, you need to house ninety percent of your students because we need to give priority to to working class people mm -hmm. in this city. Some of whom would be these Vietnam vets, of which I'm one, who are, who are homeless, or with or with there would be these homeless people who could use a a place to live in if we didn't have these people who would be willing to pay anything just to be. In college and to be in a house. I think we are really, I, I don't get your point with Eric Farrell and Camion Rise. I think he's done a hell of a lot of, against a lot of people pushing against him. But I don't, you didn't talk about how UVM could be building more houses on Trinity campus, more dorms, or they could go higher up. We are so afraid to even talk about this. And Vermont Digger had a story today about Housing crisis, not one word about the number of students that are taking up housing units in a city that's supposed to be the queen city and millennials are having to move out and yeah. drive in. And we're talking about whatever this is. That's the generation. generational conflict between me and Dina. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's my, I, I know I'm, the question is, yeah. why, why can't we take on UVM? No, we can. Um, I wasn't uh, evading that commitment. I just think that it requires coordination because at the end of the day, a lot of the power to be leveraged um, in that interaction is through the state house. Um, I think that that it, and I'm not a huge fan of that article. There was so much that was said that was not included in it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I do think that UVM can and should build more housing. And, and not only that, building more housing increases the quality of the housing for the students, because right now they're paying with their parents' money so much money for substandard units that then increases the, the standard rate in the city, but also decreases the standard quality. So I think if UVM can do more projects like the Redstone Lofts, like that's that's a, a real viable maybe 20 of those <laughs> exactly yeah yeah and i do think that we need to build up and i do think that as ranked as one of the most climate resilient cities in the country um we do need to be prepared for greater growth than we expect and we and we should um start figuring out how to build up in more places yeah, and I just because, like, in the article, I did call out UVM in the article. Like, they did say, Tina John, alumni UVM is calling UVM. But, yeah, I did hold them accountable because, like, realistically speaking, like, out-of-state kids pay way more to go to UVM than in-state kids. So why would UVM want more in-state kids than out-of-state kids if they're going to get more money from the out-of-state? Like, that, it's also the economics of it all that they're seeing, too. So that's why I'm very receptive to holding them accountable. That's why I want to make sure that the mayor is on the same board with Ward 8 because of the day, like, like he lives on summer, which is like, I don't know where district is going to go, but he's basically on Ward 8. 
like his mainstream sums are they're very close. So he, he needs to be part of this conversation. I also get the legislature to be part of this conversation. Applied pressure on UVM, I'm 100% receptive of because they're building up is something I'm about. I want more dorms being built because I, I have friends still go to UVM and they literally over admit students and then they just throw them anywhere. Like, oh, we'll just pay for your housing. Don't worry. It's like they're doing that. And why? Because they're out of state kids bringing them money. That is it. Your cash cows. It's it's literally that's it. And that's why they're if they care, they would have done something about it. But hey, if you're gonna make money from it, who's gonna stop them? They're at the state university. So well, now they got competition. Yeah, now they probably want to take away my uh, diploma. But yeah, I it's it's not something I'm scared of. That's why I said in the article. Linda? Me. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess I would just, you know, if if the redistricting maps go beyond uh, the election, I mean, I know there's uh, some attempt to try to have that all buttoned up before you guys would take uh, your positions. But if it's not, I'm just wondering how you understand uh, Ward 8's problem. I mean, I think that, you know, speaking for myself, there are a lot of different solutions, but, um, some of them, uh, you know, don't seem to work for some other people. But I was just wondering if you feel that you can uh, represent uh, our needs and if you understand that Ward 8 was gerrymandered. We didn't used to look like this. We used to be part of, uh, at least a, my particular neighborhood was part of Ward 2. Keith's neighborhood was part of Ward 6. Ward one, and, and so it should be Ward 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 six. Basically, if you look at it, I don't know why we're never there. So yeah, so I just want to know that should this issue go beyond, you know, go into <coughs> uh, the term that you would be part of, whether or not you would be able, you know, to understand and represent our interests. Yeah, I mean, I think the conversation with restricted should go into um, this term, whether it's me, myself, myself, Jake or Maya. I think, first of all, we're running for the East District. That's Ward 1 and Ward 8. So we're representing two wards. That's really, really big. So I feel like that that whoever wins up should be involved in that. And yeah, I would say the way Ward 8 looks, it's like Ward 1's so huge. Ward 8's like literally like a strip of land. It's like, it's I always, it's very off-putting. And also for me, like I live in a very family dominated neighborhood. So when I look at redistricting, like the family aspect, I really hold close. And I talked to one someone else at the Ward 1. He described it as like, I don't want um, families to be gutted out of Ward 1. And that's how I feel. And I was like, well, yeah, a lot of families in my neighborhood feel the same way. So yeah, I really, I really want to be part of the conversation with districting, especially if I'm holding, if I would, I, my Jake, Maya, whoever wants East Jake stick, like they're, they need to have that voice too. Do you, what do you think that, you know, Ward 8 has been um, advocating for, um, you know, trying to have a more, be part of a more compact community yeah. that isn't dominated by students. By students, yeah. Yeah. And, and is that something that you can support or because some of the maps that are out there resemble the current ward um, map, which is problematic. And I, um, and I, you know, the, the ad hoc committee, I don't know if you're familiar with the ad hoc committee, but the city council had an ad hoc committee, which, which, um, which ha took community input from all over the city. And one of, if not the top one, we can get the information from Anne. Uh, goal was to eliminate entirely Ward 8 or reconfigure it entirely. So I want to know whether or not you feel that you could support that. Yeah, I support reconfiguring Ward 8. I don't think it'd be student dominated. Dominated is the best answer because at the day, you know, I'm one of the young people who votes, but not a lot of students vote. That is also an issue. I think that's kind of problematic to have a ward that's predominantly students, knowing that a lot of majority, sadly, don't vote. 
And so that is something I'm supporting of reconfiguring, finding that perfect balance. Because, you know, Ward 1 is so huge. But we have like families, we have homeowners, we have renters, we have young people, we have a diverse population. I think Ward 8 deserves the same. And I think that's why I really want to have an invoice if I went city council, making sure I represent the Ward 8 concerns. Both questions? Yeah, yeah. So um, I think like I really um, take direction from Zariah, who I think has shown some good leadership in this domain where she's part of the group who is trying to figure out um, how to redistrict in the best interests of the city. But then when she is not in that group and she's sitting at the the, the working group um, of the full city council, she's advocating for um, the needs of district of, of Ward 1, right? So it's like, as a city councilor, and especially as a district councilor, you, you need to balance the interests and the needs of the whole city against the interests and the needs of your specific constituency in the East District in Wards 1 and Ward 1. Um, so I think that, um, you know, I, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing more about the specific concerns and interests of Ward 8 residents because I'm not super familiar. It's all second or third hand from other people participating in the redistricting efforts. Um, I drew a map that I think um, might be interesting to some folks in Ward 8 um, and I'd be interested um, to hear their thoughts. But um, I think that maybe this is a good opportunity for a direct democracy initiative where now that the issue is more tangible to speak more to um, the populace and, and get more feedback on some proposals. Because at the end of the day with redistricting, not everyone is gonna get what they want. And so it's, it's a question of how can we make the group that feels that they lost um, to be as small as possible and to feel like they have compromised as minimally as possible. And if I forgot any elements of that question, just let me know. <laughs> so we have about five minutes left. Yeah. Um, so we can, Linda, do you think that you have most of your questions covered? Uh, yeah, I'm just, you know, I hope my questions have been of interest to, to everybody. I mean, if Anne knows a lot about the redistricting as well as Keith and Bill, so if if they want to follow up, maybe it's a done deal. The final vote is on Monday, so ah, okay. Um, so ten years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank uh, you very much. <laughs> Any last minute Ward Eight questions? If not, we can go to our friends from Ward One. <laughs> Good, go ahead. Right. I wrote this down so I can read it fast. <laughs> uh, this is a question about voting in local elections. The canon says that there's low turnout, low voter turnout in local elections because the electorate is disconnected or alienated or simply find it irrelevant. Even the incredibly tight 2021 mayor election uh, between Moreau, Max, and Ali, which should have been critically important and relevant to all residents, had a meager turnout. Uh, one in three from Ward 1 and one in five from Ward 8. That's that's really sad. Recall that, that ballots were mailed to every single registered voter. All they had to do was lick the envelope. That's all they had to do. And yet one in five in Ward 8 and one in three in Ward 1. What motivates you to vote in local elections and how can you work to increase engagement in the electorate? Take your first. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that. Um, so, uh, my first civic board that I joined was the board for the registration of voters, because that's something that I care about. I think that democracy is kind of, mm, it's kind of just for show if we don't have better participation, right? Like if you look at the two caucuses, the democratic and the progressive caucus for, for this race, it was 70 people combining the voters for those two caucuses that decided who had which endorsement. So I think, um, yeah, voter turnout and, and people feeling like they have, they can make a difference is, is something that's always been important to me. And that's why the first thing I did um, in my civic engagement um, 
with city government was on the BRB. And um, the, a lot of the work that I did there was, was voter registration drives. I think ultimately it comes down to reconfiguring how we do our campaigns and how we communicate about them. You know, we, we didn't do campaign finance reform at the national level, and we didn't really do it um, in a super meaningful way at the state level. So maybe we can do that at the city level. And as we implement um, uh, ranked choice voting, maybe we can create a system where, you know, we have a central information point and we have like the city puts together, the BRV puts together, here are your three candidates that you get to choose from. Here are their statements on these issues. Here are little video clips. Everyone gets the same, and it's all one single point of access. Um, yeah, I and I think to what Dina has said in her campaign, we we need to make it more accessible to people who speak different languages. Um, yeah, so since... My experience as I've been like door knocking every day is that I'm I'm 50 percent listening to people, but the 50 percent is telling people about this election. And, like either way, we have like the lawn signs out, we have the NPA meetings, the newspapers. But yeah, me, my team, every day we're just telling people, hey, there's election. Oh, I didn't know. You know, that's something my team and I have been really, really frustrated about because then they, they know very well. I just care about also the long term effects of this all, because like I said earlier, like this, there's a shift. We all feel this sense of unease, discomfort, frustration. I really want the long term aspect of it. And I think that's why every day I'm just trying to get people to know there's election. And also as a new American and a BIPOC person, um, like <sighs> Accessibility is so, so important. You know, I would say like I'm very privileged where I came to this country earlier on that I was able to learn English at a faster rate, but not a lot of New American people have that privilege. My parents don't have that privilege, but my dad speaks five languages. Since I ran, he was like, oh, wait, what if I can start coming to these events and like translating so more a diverse pool of people can come? He didn't even know that was a needed skill. So that's why I've been kind of working with different New American communities about getting them being a part of it. Um, and like, honestly, as a black black person, um, you know, the tele televised police brutality murders we have seen has made us very scared of like and less trustful of political elections and government officials. I'm trying to really work on that fear and say, hey, let's we also need to vote, you know, and I think. Basically, my campaign is more so advocating for that because end of the day, like this election is going to come, it's going to go. Another one's going to come. Another one's going to come. Like, let's not make a campaign about telling people to vote. Let's get them that they already know about the campaign. And can I use a rebuttal? Um, which is to say that sometimes it's not about campaigns for people, right? Sometimes it's about campaigns for issues. And we have had so many campaigns in this city um, to uh, say that we don't want the F-35s, to say that we want Burlington Telecom to remain community owned, to different community led movements in this city that have amounted to very little because our city council and the mayor both have the ability to say, we are not going to accept this petition drive and we are not going to put this on the ballot or for a ballot initiative to be advisory only. And, you know, 65% of the population can say, no, we don't want F-35s. And city council effectively says, we don't care. So, you know, let me plug Proposition Zero. Uh, when it comes before you in March, please support it because the people can feel empowered if they actually have power. I would just like to make a counter argument to that. That is the habit of putting complex um, policy decisions to a vote for the people. An example of that would be Brexit, um, <laughs> where I think a lot of people have voted for it. Um, and there are some decisions that are really made by people who understand the issue and not just. Um, not outside the door. Thrown into the public to vote on it in 30 seconds. Now, I agree, there's definitely things that should be voted, presented to the public as something they can vote on. But it's not quite as simple as just 
straight democracy for every policy decision. Um, if, you, if you guys want a minute to rebut, just so we can yeah. kind of stay on time and then. Well, I'll agree and disagree. I will agree by saying that, yes, I guess to an extent that is true. And that's why um, we have campaigns, right? The, the opposition is going to raise money and coalesce an argument to be made in a public manner. But I would also push back on your argument and say that we can't we can't let fear stand in the way of empowering the public to have a voice in how our democracy functions. That's the yeah. what, are the, what are the statistics for voter turnout in Ward 8? Do you remember those off the top of your head? Uh, you, well, it's very you low said, and very you high. You said it was one in five in that 2020. Was that was the mayor all that you probably remember. There are 4,250 on campus that don't, that uh, on, in dorms. And it, that's part of board eight. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if you want to respond, and then um, we have, we'll give you guys a minute for closing arguments. I'm sorry, we're running yeah. a little bit yeah. behind. I'll keep it very brief brief um yeah i i agree with you in the sense of yeah some issues community inputs really critical but some issues you know i think that's how we elect counselors and state reps to represent us so i really feel like there is a balance we have state representatives for a reason so i also would put pressure on them to making sure no offense china to making sure like they are also um educating their constituents like hey this is happening i'm planning on voting this way just like letting you know like that education is really important just even the committee cannot vote on everything. Let's making sure the people who are voting for us is educating us about what is going on, and that that adds to that. And as well as I talk to state reps, I really want to make sure when we're educating people what's going on as they're making the votes, it's accessible to everyone. So we, if you want to issue two minutes for a closing statement, thank you to everyone for your question. Can maybe get your comment or question in the last bit after our candidates do their closing statements. Okay. Yeah, I gotta go. Thank you. Running. Good luck. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Good luck to you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Um, I'll make it brief so you can have a time to answer your question. Um, but um, yeah, I mean. First and foremost, like when I first ran, you know, my focus was affordable housing, as well as how to get new American people more involved in public issues. But it has since grown. And I really have just really enjoyed campaigning like every day I'm outside door knocking from five to eight up until like 10 sometimes just talking to the community because like even like this Ward 8, as well as the last two Ward 1s, I've, I've been through a lot of things we're talking about is so emotionally charging it really is sensitive it's really is hard especially when you feel the victim of it and i think i'm really excited to run because since i've put out my vote out there like a lot of different groups have now been wanting to join more of the conversation i really just want a long-term impact i care more more about my community more so than my own candidacy at the end of the day and i think whoever wins i just want to make sure bring my support and i'm really really excited just to be a part of i don't know east district you know i'm really glad to be here so I've been a member of this community for 13 years, um, going on 14 now. Um, and in that period of time, I have volunteered and I've worked in the nonprofit sector. I've worked in the service sector. I've worked in social services. I became an EMT. I've worked for DCF. I have worked for homeless folks and with homeless folks. Um, but when I was young in this community and I stood up and I volunteered to take on more responsibility and participate in a more meaningful way, I was told, you know, you can boy join a, a board or a commission. Um, and I did that. And, you know, still to this day, I'm told, you know, you, you could join a board or a commission. Um, and I think that there's a strong generational component to this race where Dina, myself, and Maya are three different generations. Um, and I feel like at this point, my generation has been waiting to take over the torch. And um, if we if we try to take that torch too strongly, then we we 
risk perpetuating the harm that has been caused to us on the next generation. I think that it's rare for a young person to step up the way that Dina has. And I think that it's impactful and meaningful for us to support that person. I think when Ali said that young people have struggle on city council, it's because she wasn't supported. Um, and I think in this race, you have three people who all want to support each other. Um, and so at this time, I think that I would like to say that I have been waiting for an opportunity to serve this community a more meaningful way. And I am happy to continue waiting. Um, I think that Dina has stepped up and is is raised her hand to serve this community. And, and I would like to endorse her and, and say that anybody who is considering supporting me should, should vote for Dina. Um, because I think that this is a moment for you to become the leader that we would like to see you be in this community. And I think that you've got a lot of support in this room from people that, that we've built community with together. Thank you both. <laughs> yeah. Did, uh, did you want to, did he, did yeah, you want to say something? I just want to answer the, uh, oh, that's okay. Uh, the point I made earlier about um, oh. pricing compared to not leaving. Oh, okay. Pricing, but, um, and that's why for me, like the process is like we have 2,000 voters basically vetting any proposal. So it's not just throwing it to the public. Uh, Burlington is 30, or oh, I'm sorry, it's like 850,000 uh, people, not comparable to Brexit. So thank you. Thank you. I, I, thank I will, you. Uh, we've gone over, but we've we've always worried if we could even go an hour. And this yeah. is amazing. Now we've got an hour and 20 minutes. And I, I hope everybody's had a chance to ask, to ask their questions. So we'll sign off for Ward 8 NPA. Thank you very much for thank coming you. and listening. Thank you to everyone. Thanks to the yeah. candidates.